Uh, maybe you get now what I meant last night when I said that uh, I was hoping that this would be a different kind of marriage conference. Um, I am making this as complicated as it is. <laughs> in other words, kind of half of what I do in my practice is put bad marriages back together. And this is how I do it. I'm not soft peddling it. I'm not popularizing it to make it easier. This is not Cox's 10 Easy Steps to Hot Racy Romance. This is like, how do you really make sense of marriage? So, um, you know, church leaders will ask me lots of times, like, what can we do, be doing to help marriages and our church and all that? And, and um, you know, some of the problem in our culture is that we don't take seriously enough how complex it is to be married well. And there's a lot going on, and I really want you to have at least a, a flyby this weekend of what all is going on. And you singles, you know, you're going to meet, you know, your dream boat, and I don't want to be like Johnny Raincloud or something, but then things get hard, all right? And I want to talk to you about how we make hard stuff work, okay? But it is difficult. Um, when I was in seminary, there was a couple, that, uh, one of my professors, Dr. Simon Kistemacher, he was from Ho uh, Holland. Yeah, they were Dutch. And he and Mrs. Kistemacher have been married like 98 years, you know. And he taught he the taught, yeah, New Testament and he taught Greek. So uh, one evening, uh, Mrs. Kistemacher did a thing for the wives of seminary students. And she talked about marriage, talked about marriage, talked about marriage. And so during their Q&A at the, at the end, and this one wife goes, So, Mrs. Kistemacher, you're saying that in all of these years that y'all have been married, you've never considered divorce? And she goes, oh, oh, no, never, never. Murder? Uh, no. Okay, so, <laughs> so we got to get real here, right? All right? Even Mrs. Kistemacher. All right, last night we talked about four areas that we kind of have to have ticking in order to do real life that, that makes uh, marriages work, relationships work, and then we added a fifth eye, and that was that orientation to see in our 50% contribution to our, um, our marriage and our issues. So our point last night was that our marriages just don't struggle because you're a jerk or just a sinner or whatever. It's because we're lacking abilities in the image of God, to put this in a spiritual context. Some of the qualities he created us to have to have in order to make life work, and this could be a conference on job performance. How's your job going to go if you never learn that ability of imperfection and failing? How's your obedience to God going to go if you never made sense of submission, okay? Um, so this morning we're going to look at two of our uh, abilities from last night and pull those apart a little bit. We're going to look at intimacy, essentially, can we be close right now? And then we're going to look at conflict and fighting, which kind of falls under the dynamic of identity. In other words, if I exist and you exist, then we're going to have conflict in some way, all right? Uh, that is the name of my podcast. I didn't have it up on the screen last night. But um, it has every – my podcast is not like I'm John and my guest today is Barack Obama. It's more like, you know <laughs> – a platform for every conference I've done, okay? So people were always going, how can I get your conference? And I was like, you know, burning CDs and stuff. You know, I'm a, anyway, 60s guy uh, trying to catch up with technology. So finally I just put them on this platform. Good enough living, whatever, all right. You can get more of the stuff. I wish we could unpack all of them is my point. Um, and we'll hit more of them during Q&A. And I got so many good text questions from y'all last night, and the, I could feel the Q&A building last night that I'm going to um, maybe um, thin out these talks a little bit so we can have more time to do Q&A, but let's talk about intimacy. So, I mean, you know, if you're going to be married, you might want to learn what it means to be emotionally close, you know, call me crazy, but um, guys get a lot of, a lot of stereotypical hassle about this intimacy thing. But like I said last night, it's not always the guy. You know, Norm and I are reversed. But, but you know, you, you, ladies, you're out to dinner with your husband and you're sitting across from him and you look at him and you go, what are you thinking? And you're hoping he's going to say, you know, something like, just that I've got everything I need right now, right 
here, you know. But if you're dealing with a guy, you know, like a regular guy, we're going to say, I was just thinking, you know, you don't really think about how big pigs really are. I mean, they're really, I mean, you could ride some of them, they're so big. You know, and there's, there's your date night, all right? <laughs> so there's, you know, there's disappointments here and, and, and things we've got to make sense of. But understanding intimacy and closeness is what marriage is for, okay? You know, naked and not ashamed, right? Um, you know, it's not good for the man to be alone. And when the Bible describes uh, Adam and Eve as being naked and not ashamed, it's not like describing like a nudist colony or something. What it's describing is a relational status. In other words, it's saying that in, in their marriage, Adam and Eve were able to be fully who they are, and it was safe. Fully unclothed, unguarded, non-defensive, and it's welcome. I mean, think about it. Isn't that what you want? That's what you're wanting in your marriage. You express an idea it's welcomed or a need and it's at least engaged or a mess up and it's forgiven. Like, anybody interested? <laughs> like, we'll pass a sign-up sheet around. See, you know, and we'd all sign because I think this is what we we're created for. And, and actually, I think this is a lot of what heaven will be, not just oneness with God but with each other. The last chapter of the one story um, is is some of my musings on what heaven is lo- uh, will be like, and um, w- an intimacy with one another is is one of the pieces of it. I think. So when God says it's not good for the man to be alone, that's not just the invention of marriage; it's the invention of relationship and connection. So we're going to talk this morning about what God calls abiding and knowing, what shrinks call attachment, what last night we called let you in, keep you in. And we're going to talk about three things about intimacy here this morning. We're going to sort of talk a little overview about what is it? Because it's a word we banty around a lot, but I want to create a little bit of common ground categories for us all so we can know what we're talking about, what it is, and what it's not, okay? Secondly, some ways we can struggle with intimacy. Couples have patterns of how they typically mess up the whole intimacy dynamic. I want us to talk about what that can look like. And thirdly, how we can do it better and grow, all right? So, let's roll. What do we mean when we talk about intimacy and closeness, all right? I just was thinking one day, years ago, like, people were always talking about we need more intimacy or more communication or whatever in a relationship. I'm like, what does that mean? By the way, that reminds me of this couple I was was talking with once. And as I I stopped the session, I said, you know, what I think you guys really need in your marriage is we need to help create more intimacy in y'all's relationship and the dude goes awesome and the wife goes he means emotional intimacy all right anyway so what are we talking about here okay it's like all of a sudden that was his favorite therapist um (laughs) so what do we mean when we talk about intimacy and closeness first off you got to realize there's different levels of it there's kind of concentric circles of it um, being emotionally close is, is, is relative term, like, like being rich. You know, being rich in Jackson, Mississippi and being rich in North Shore, Chicago or something, those are relative things. So likewise, emotionally close is kind of this relative thing. I like to name four different levels of intimacy. Um, let's articulate them, at least kind of get them um, laid out for us. We can use as a model later on. Level number one is drive-through, and this is basically what it sounds like. It's the level of personal intimacy with which you say things to others like, would you like fries with that, okay? Or, you know, would you push two for me on the elevator? Uh, You're just kind of crossing paths with people here. There's not any real connection. Um, The only reason you're you're interacting is because it's, hey, how you doing, right? Or (laughs) drive-through can be where your spouse goes when they're mad at you. Okay, you can also say, how are you? Fine. Okay. Um, anyway, if this describes the depth of your romantic relationship, please see me after class, all right? Now, number two, new sports and weather. We alluded to this last night. L- a little bit deeper level of intimacy. It can be very friendly, very connected. How you doing? Have you, you know, have you heard about so-and-so? Um, what's your favorite ball team? What about this beautiful day we have? Um, It's also your opinions, the things you like, things you're into. I wish I was as cool as Jordan Peterson, you know, or Bootsy Collins. I would take either one of them, all right? 
Any of y'all know who Bootsy Collins is? All right. Look him up. You'll get it later. All right. Anyway, now, this is kind of superficial interaction, and that's fine. Most relationships begin there. Uh, all relationships go there sometimes. I think you actually need to be able to do superficial sometimes. I had this friend in grad school in California who could not be superficial. And it's like you'd see her on campus and go, hey, Sally, what's up? And she'd go, well, I've been having a lot of anxiety and depressive ideation regarding some issues with my family of origin. And you're like, no way, me too. You know, it's like, what do you say to that? You know? <laughs> See you later. Yeah, okay. So anyway, so we got to do new sports and weather sometimes, all right? But if you live there, you'll be one of those people who's just well-informed Mr. Chit Chat. But, you know, as we said last night, we're not at the truth yet, okay? Some marriages settle into new sports and weather, and all they talk about is kind of the latest scandal or what you do today or whatever. That's kind of the roommate phenomenon, right? Because going any deeper starts to get threatening to them or they get into hostility or whatever, and they've kind of had to give up and just live at new sports and weather. Let's not, let's not give up, okay? All right, number three level is I call TCB. We got any Elvis fans here? What's TCB mean? Think of business. Actually, it should be TCBB, taking care of business, baby, all right? So Elvis had this sort of entourage they called the Memphis Mafia, and they just sort of surrounded him and got stuff done for him, and they'd just be all about going, TCB, Elvis, like they're taking care of the business, getting it done, all right? That's what I call level three, because this is the level at which we give opinions and solve problems. It's where we're living practically. It's what I'm doing right now. I'm actually addressing a problem and giving you opinions and teaching you. It's when you say, I think we need to stay within our budget, or let's get that used car, this is where I actually work to solve a problem or give an opinion. This is Martha working in the Bible. Okay, this is what you do at work. And this is probably where you spend most of your time functionally, okay? And it's legit, all right? Um, if this were a talk on being practical, making life work, we could switch to Q&A now. I mean, we're done, you know? Um, close Stanford's benediction. Um, in that we do have to make life work, which we'll touch on a little bit, some of us super relational types have trouble with. In other words, this is a talk on intimacy, and, and we're ultimately going to go beyond TCB, but we're not dissing TCB because you've got to make life work, okay? Um, and a lot of us touchy-feely relational types want to sit around and kumbaya all the time, but it's a good thing we married somebody who knows how to pay the bills, okay? So... If this were a talk on just being practical, TCBers, high five, we're grateful for y'all. More on that later on. Um, but if TCB is all you can do, if that's as deep as you can go, is solve problems, give opinions, or really you're having trouble with that, you're feeling sad, well, why don't you, you know, you go watch a movie? Like, let's go on a walk. And there's always a fix-it solution. If you live there, your life's going to work well, and you'll get a lot of things done. And granted, this is more intimate than anything we've done so far. These are your opinions and your thoughts and your solutions. But if, it's, if you stop here, if this is as far as you can go in terms of real connection, it'll actually be sadder than that scene, you know, where in Dumbo where they lock up Dumbo's mother. That sad. It'll be that sad, okay? I mean, that sad. Right, because there'll be a real sense in which nobody really knows you, okay? Especially your spouse. This isn't your deepest heart yet, and this is a talk on intimacy, and intimacy needs something beyond the get stuff done mode. Think about it. Adam had meaningful work to do in the garden, naming animals and subduing the planet, and God said, not good. The first not good was about aloneness. Okay? God's like, we got to get some human contact in there. Which leads us to level four, which God calls abiding, so I will too. All right, this is Jedi level, guys. All right, this is where we develop kind of the personal gravity, and it actually does take a level of emotional, personal strength to go here, to be powerful enough to take the risk of connecting with who I am emotionally and sharing that. I got to be strong enough to not have to live like I'm Steve McQueen or or Gwyneth Paltrow, or, you know, people who've got it all together, you know, and be like the person I really am, 
with the person I'm with. This is let you in from last night, okay? This is where, it's actually the only place where we can have the kind of connection where I can look in somebody else's eyes and know that those eyes know some junk about me, some garbage about me, but those eyes know me. I'm, I'm not living hidden, okay? I don't think you get that at any other level, and it's the foundation for really rich marriage. Here's another way of saying it. We all have a true self, okay? Kind of a pop psychology word, but I like it. Kind of non-chameleon you. I saw a guy once years ago, he said, I'm like a sponge. If you throw me in purple water, I kind of turn purple. If you throw me in green water, I kind of turn green. I'm kind of what people want. And as we were talking last night, how do we learn who we really are? The true self thing is, who is John for real? Like, what is it like to be me? You know, it, there's a, Chris Rock had a great joke about that. He said, when somebody first meets you, he said, they're not meeting you. They're meeting your representative. Somebody sent ahead to make you look good, all right? <laughs> then by the time they get to know you, it's too late. So anyway, true self is basically, ab abiding connection, this level is basically your true self shared. Okay? Intimacy is real me, what it feels like to be me, who I am, brought to you. Okay? That's what intimacy is. We're not building jet planes here. All right? So think about it even just superficially. Subjectively, what does it feel like to be you emotionally? You wake up in the morning, you think, oh, it's Saturday morning for a conference. I love those. Or you wake up Monday morning, you go, ah, it's Monday. Ugh. And that report's due Thursday, and I even started. But I have a fun lunch today. Uh, at least it's not a foot of snow outside. I mean, you hear the you there? You are going through the sense of what it feels like to be you. And that's emotional. You're experiencing emotions about your world, okay? That's you, okay? Everyone shake hands with you, okay? That's your, your subjective experience of your heart. Now, PC beers, this is why your abiding, connecting, relational spouse wants to talk to you about your day when you get home. It's not because they're secretly writing the biography of Dr. John L. Cox. It's because your, your subjective emotional experience of your day is your heart. It's your you, and they want to connect with you. It's not like they're just wanting to go over every meeting you want to forget. They want to know you, okay? So that's easy, okay? Kind of my little experience in my life. But this kind of abiding also goes deeper and more connected into our real hearts. In other words, there are things, there are some things that we feel emotionally that are more vulnerable and that are more meaningful and that are more powerful or maybe feel scared or feel hurt. Can I share those? Can we take it up another notch? Can that subjective experience about me also tell you something really meaningful about my heart? Maybe that that I feel ashamed, or that I love you, or that I need you. Can I do that? Let me give you an example. I'm going to tell the same story, and I'm going to tell it one version TCB, and I'm going to tell it another version more abiding, and I want you to hear it and get it. So my dad flew early jets in the 50s, and so I've flown my whole life with him. He was an Air Force instructor in T-33s, and... Uh, I don't know, even as a little kid, I'm like, my dad's an Air Force instructor. I ought to let him teach me to fly. So I've been flying my whole life. So uh, in 2017, I found this guy in Santa Fe, New Mexico, who had a T-33 that had been perfectly restored. And he is a two-seat plane, and he would sit in the front and lets people who can fly sit in the back, and he just lets them fly his jet. And I'm like, Dad, we're going to go do this. So Call this guy, check him out. If not, we're gonna, we're, you, you're going to fly your plane one more time before you die, and I'm going to fly your plane. How cool is that? So we went to New Mexico and flew his jet and took my mom. It was really cool. All right, we got the facts. Abiding version. I have spent my life as a child seeing pictures of this man sitting in this cockpit or kneeling up on the side of the plane and I've flown with him a thousand times, and I've heard a million stories. I've built models of this plane. And on that morning in New Mexico, I watched an 82-year-old man climb into that jet, and I heard that Allison engine start to screw up. I'm standing there next to my little mom, and they start to taxi away, and it smells like kerosene, you know? 
in the taxi all the way down the end of the runway, runway 220, the 20 end of the runway. And you can see the heat ripple before you can hear him. And as my mom and I stand there, I watch my dad blasting off again in his car. And then I go, here, I'll show you. There, come back. There. It's actually a picture I took from my GoPro. See, I'm sideways. That's the horizon. I'm there. I'm in the, and this, this, yeah. It really happened. I'm not making this up, okay? Now, can you feel the difference in my two stories? Did you feel the difference? One of them, you got the facts. We went to New Mexico. We flew T-Birds. The next one, you got what it was like to see my dad stand next to my little mom to then be in that plane, the plane I've heard the stories, and I could feel it. And it was scary. All right, I brought my heart to you that time. I want you to hear the difference and feel the difference because I want there to be that kind of connecting and abiding in your marriage. And those of you who are more TCBers are going to kind of go, yeah, but I told you about the airplane. And your spouse is going to be, yeah, but you didn't. Okay? And in my first version, I really didn't. I want you to have that category, all right? So, can I share me with you? Part of let you in, part of abiding in intimacy is can I bring my heart and bring it to you? Again, that's what intimacy is, knowing what I feel and being willing to share it to you. Nothing spooky and psychological here. We're not rolling chicken bones or anything, all right? We're just talking about can I bring my heart to you, all right? Now, just briefly... Let's talk about feelings just briefly because a lot of this is about feelings. And feelings can get twitchy. A, they feel vulnerable. B, a lot of people get a lot of messages that that's weak. You can't have feelings. Um, you know, I'm out, I, I felt tears behind my eyes last night when we were talking about my brother and just then talking about my dad in the plane. I mean, does that mean I'm a sissy? You know, a lot of people learn that if you have emotion, it's kind of like weak. Um, evangelical Christianity, it's like emotions aren't that important. Um, you know, what matters is the facts of what we believe and our theology and the truth and how you feel about that doesn't make any difference. And there's a sense in which that's true. I mean, if I don't feel like God loves me, that doesn't mean he doesn't love me any more than I don't feel like that truck's going to hit me. doesn't mean I'm safe from not getting hit by the truck. So feelings aren't real good about external reality. But this, this is a marriage conference, right? This is not the Council of Chalcedon. It's a marriage conference. And even though feelings don't give us a lot of real accurate information sometimes about the external reality, they are the core number one primary means by which I know my heart and connect my heart, okay? In other words, if you and I had a discussion after the conference today about some meaningless topic, how often you should change your oil or whatever, you'd forget that in a little bit. But if I insulted you or criticized you, or hurt your feelings, you'd remember that like two years from now, they'd be going, we're getting John Cox back to do another conference. You'd be going, well, you know what that guy said to me like two years ago? You know, why? Because I'd hurt your feelings, all right? Now, is that logical? No, but the emotional connection piece, what happens in my emotional world is the, 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 the ground zero for relational connection, okay? So to have a relationship with people in which hearts matter, yes, we're going to let them in. Yes, we're going to share me, but we're also going to let what they feel be something that we engage with. The next question is, can I hear you? When you are hurting, can I connect with the feeling there? You just heard my story about me and my dad in the plane. Norma's mother blessedly went to be with Jesus last month, but before that was ill for seven years. It was terrible. Um, and one day I walked in, and she was just so down and so depressed. And I said, what's up? And she said, another one of mother's sitters quit, and I've got to find another sitter, and it's just like it just never ends. Now, TCB answer to that, well, don't they have, like, agencies and stuff that help find these people? Is that correct? Yes. Is it connected? No. All right? So I'm a well-trained mental health professional. I didn't say that. 
I said, oh my gosh, it's like this responsibility never gets better. I'm hearing her. I'm going to try on what she's t feeling, and I'm going to talk to her about it. You want to know how to connect and be emotionally close? I'm trying on what, what must it feel like to be her in this situation? She wants to rip her skin off. She's so sick of this. I'm like, you get everything settled, and it just blows up again. Oh, my gosh, I know you're exhausted. And what happens? What does she do? She starts to cry. Oh, my gosh, did I make it worse? No, I made it better. Why is she crying? Because she felt heard. She felt understood. She felt connected to. Here's one of my little favorite sayings. The feeling of being gotten and being understood. Yes, that's it. You got it. Is as close to the feeling of being loved. So close that they're almost indistinguishable. Right? And so when you hear somebody and what they feel, you're connecting with them in a way that it's, it's gold, man. Okay? Now, after that, after that, you can TCB if you want. Just get your order right. People got to be heard before the TCB, okay? Now, after Norma's cried, and I've gotten like 100 husband points, um, I get to say, I, would, I will help you think through some solutions if you want on her terms, okay? Don't be Mr. Fixer. Well, you know, our agencies, that, that makes people feel minimized, all right? Hear them first, bring the truth later. Get that order down, all right? We're going to touch on that again in a little bit. So we're not abdicating reality and solutions. We're just getting them in the right order, okay? So I saw a couple a while back, and he was his total TCBer. She had just lost her job and was crying and just devastated and frightened and ashamed and all that, and they came into the office, and she really needed comfort. And he was such a TCBer, I, I wrote down, I asked him if I could write down what he said. Um, I said, how do you respond? Your wife's hurting from this job and all that. And he said, well, I don't see that the, the job loss is a bad choice because her boss did retire, but I do want to know her plans so I can make adequate preparation. And I'm like, this program is performed an illegal function and will be shut down. I'm like, dude. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 no. What do you feel? And he goes, what is there to feel now? We're just taking care of business. He literally said that. That's why I asked him if I could write it down. Because this is like in my marriage conference. And, but he was engaged with solving the problem, but not her heart. I want you to have that distinction. Now, what we're talking about here is basically empathy, which is the pop psychology word for trying on what someone else is feeling and talking to them about it. Sympathy is trying on what somebody else is feeling and talking to them about what I feel about it. <laughs> empathy is talking to them about what they feel. So... Let me ask you this. Could you feel my feelings about me and dad in the jet? Could you feel it? There you go. You got it. If you're out there going, oh, I could never do this empathy stuff, you just did. You felt the difference. You felt my heart. You felt like what it meant to me. Congratulations, student. Okay? That's all we're talking about. Dumping some of the stuff so we can have more time together. All right, so TCB Elvis or Elvira, like I say, some TCBers are women. What they mean when they say, I want you to hear my feelings, or when us relational, emotional dudes want to complain about work, whatever, is that for emotionally awake humans, the Feelings that we have connect the deepest part of who we are. And if you care about loving your spouse and connecting with them in a meaningful way, take good notes today. This is an important part of being a human. And in our culture, and especially with men, we're taught, you know, suck it up, you know, go be John Wayne and all that, and live and engage with the, that sense of feel I talked about last night, that ability to have a feeling and really learn from it and it give me information and allow me to connect with you. It's a tool. Okay? It's not snoopy, touchy-feely time, all right? If you care about that kind of connection, learn to let that kind of matter. Learn about what that means. You can learn. Body of Christ people can help you. Um, now, I will grant this. Feelings will not always make sense, all right? So one night, in the middle of the night, Norma wakes me up. I wake up because she's like punching my shoulder, 
like, mad at you. And I'm like, what? She said, I'm mad at you. I'm like, what? She said, I just had this dream. We were driving through the desert, and you just rode off and left me there. I'm like, what do you say? That? I'm like, well, go back to sleep. I'll come pick you up. I don't know. <laughs> what are you supposed to say to that? And don't forget, TC Beers have a point. I was working with a couple once and teaching him to quit trying to fix everything and just hear her feelings. So he comes down to go to work one day, and, and she, she's there in the kitchen. She goes, oh, oh baby, baby, baby. Okay, I went up. My, my tire, my car, the tire, it's flat. And I just, I'm, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I, I, I'm freaking out. I got to get the kids to school. I, I don't know. Should we call AAA? I don't know. What, and he said, I can hear that you feel a lot of anxiety and concern. <laughs> He had a good time with that, trust me, you know? All right. Uh, another, by the way, here, I think that, that the abiding level of connection is the number one foundation for sexuality. 99% of the couples I work with in my office who struggle in the sexual realm, the problem does not necessarily exist in the sexual part of their relationship. Usually what you find is it's connected more to the abiding intimacy part of their relationship, sometimes the identity part. In other words, I always tell couples that our, our sexuality ought to be the physical expression of the emotional intimacy that we're having, okay? So sometimes if our emotional connection is, feels a little squirrely, people who are emotionally connected are going to have a little bit of struggle with sexuality. So a lot of times we can really help fix sexuality by fixing some of the emotional connection pain. TCBers, this is why you're emotional emotionally connected spouse can look at you like you're crazy if you've um you know been emotionally distant all day long and then all of a sudden you know it, you know that night you're like hey let's get frisky to them they're a little confused all right to them it's kind of feels like you've said i've left the united states i defy patriotism burn the flag don't like america hey can we have a big fourth of july party tonight and you're like I'm confused because I thought you weren't into America and Fourth of July is kind of to celebrate America and so like it's a, a party but and they're like yeah right but I just like hot dogs and fireworks I don't understand you know and and, <laughs> and that joke doesn't work as well if you say anything but hot dogs it's like the hot dogs it can't be hamburgers and anyway you know where I'm going it's not hamburgers and fireworks it's hot dogs and fireworks but Okay, on the other hand, sex is also a language of fun, and TC beers get that, and, you know, don't knock it till you tried it. But, all right, a couple of sex jokes for you, because how can we resist? I was working with a couple once, and they had seen another therapist, and um, the therapist had had them, like, write down a list of the things that you want in your marriage, things you'd like to see improved, and they, I don't do that in my office, but they showed me their list, and one of the things on his list was, he said, sex at least once a week with enthusiasm. <laughs> Apparently he had had to add that disclaimer, you know, from personal experience, I'm sure. Um, another guy said that he wanted to talk to his wife to see if she could give him any pointers for initiating sex because she had a 100% success rate. And he wanted to know, like, what's the secret to that? Anyway, but, uh, <laughs> all right, another, by the way, regarding intimacy, um, you see what I'm doing? I'm talking about the major theme of intimacy, and I'm doing, I'm talking about some of the questions and issues that come up for people around it. A lot of times when we talk about intimacy like this, couples in the trenches have a question, hey, Cox, that sounds great, but, I mean, did you see the nursery? We've got all these kids. We don't have the bandwidth to you know, stop and be connected and share our hearts at a level four, blah, blah, blah. Good question. Answer number one, that's legitimate. Oh, look, my eighth grade boy joke. Um, answer number one, that's legit. You are correct. Um, I ran across a study when um, I was in graduate school that graphed 
marital satisfaction over the lifespan. And what it saw was this. When you first get married, it's like, woo, woo, we've got great, life is great, marriage is great. And then as you have kids, marital satisfaction starts to drop like this. And then it sort of hangs out, and here's a date night, and there's like an anniversary trip and whatever like that. And then empty nest, like Norm and I are in now, it's like marital satisfaction comes back up. And you've got this U-shaped thing. Anyway, when, back when I was teaching Sunday school all the time at my own church and would talk about this, I would see my friends, you know, we'd be dragging our kids in the rain to church and be like, how are y'all? And they're like, it became a joke about me because everybody knew this. They'd go, we're in the bottom of the U, bottom of the U. <laughs> So yes, you are correct. You are in the bottom of the U. So, you know, catch as catch can, do what you can. But number two is this. Intimacy is not just date night, all right? In other words, if what you're hearing is what we need is some knee to knee sharing time and that's what intimacy is, you're missing me, okay? Intimacy is not about us necessarily having an opportunity to share all of the different feelings I had today. Intimacy is just, I live in a way with you where my heart meets yours, okay? So yeah, look for times that you can be together, but some of the deepest connection I've ever had in my marriage was across a gurney in an ER as someone, one of my kids was getting their, their, uh, their broken leg set. Or where are my friends, uh, Brian, etc. Where are y'all? My diabetic friends, yes. We have a type 1 diabetic child. We've been sharing, uh, our, our oldest was type 1 diabetic. And I'm getting teary like you know, I'm bringing it up. The body of Christ kind of experiences. People understand what we live in. Um, engage in something like diabetes with our oldest child. And the fear of that together. And the vulnerability of that together. Intimacy is not like, let me tell you what I felt at today's meeting. Intimacy is saying, I'm scared about this. Me too. Here's another intimate statement. I am so exhausted right now. I have no bandwidth at all to give anything or share anything. I just need to collapse and let's just kind of be dead together. Want to? Yeah. I talked to a couple this past week who did such cool things with that. Um, they had both had terrible weeks and they were just crushed by them. And they were telling me the story that they both got home and they both were pretty needful, and they were both pretty emotionally exhausted. And they said to one another, I got nothing. In fact, I'm dying here. And they're like, really, I'm dying here too. I got nothing. And what they told me they said, I mean, I wanted to do herkies. They said, we looked at each other and said, well, let's just be together then. In other words, that was their intimacy. I'm very tired. I don't have anything to share. I don't have anything to give but I'm really wiped out. Want to be wiped out together? That also is intimacy. Do you hear how, how core that is? I'm not taking time out. Where it's, you know, there's more to intimacy than it's not, not you know, holding hands at a two-top. It might be being two exhausted parents who are you know, covered in poo. Cleaned up that. Norman and I used to say, you know, when they throw it in the bed, she would tend to the kid and I'd run it down and run the laundry. We had this you know, scheme. That's intimacy, man. Just have that eye contact, that connection that says, how much is this bad? This is our life. This is us. Okay? So don't put intimacy in a box of romance. Don't put intimacy in a box of emotional, psychological connection. Put intimacy in a bigger box of my life, my heart abides with you all the time. Okay? So we don't take time to do intimacy. We live it in the way in which we connect with one another. And it happens all the times just in what you run across. All right, so don't miss that point. Which reminds me, uh, I want to touch on this again. We're pushing on abiding in intimacy because that's our topic. But remember, TC being and abiding are both important. All right, TC being still important. I don't want to dish you TC beers. And as I said, practically speaking, this abiding connection will not be where you spend most of your time. We have to have TCB to function. Y'all know those couples who are both abiders? You know them? And they abide in kind of gazy, loving connection 24-7. And they have like a family tree house. And they make, you know, Chinese hot air balloon lanterns and let them go with the kids. But, you know, 
but they've got like six kids in dirty diapers and two rusty Subarus in the garage, and nobody's running this love fest, you know? <laughs> They're not paying their bills, okay? Which, again, is why a lot of us emotionally connector types were drawn to and attracted to and married these TCBers in the first place because back then we needed the structure. They felt so grounded and practical compared to us. They made life happen. That felt safe back then. And then we resent them later for being so unemotional. So touch your feelers, recognize that. We, we need these people, okay? The goal, by the way, is to be integrated um, like Christ. In other words, there's room for the TCB or to learn more about emotional connection, and there's growth for the abider connector types to learn more about containing emotion, not just dumping feelings, going frontal lobe and being grounded, which leads us to part two. Remember we said last night, right about now, all of the connect the emotional people are going, yeah, I love it. This is that great marriage conference stuff where you learn about sharing better, okay? But remember, there's another side to this, which we cannot lose, and that is keep you in. And that is, if we're asking what needs to happen in a marriage to build intimacy, yeah, sure, we need to be able to go to level four, tell the jet story with my heart, not just my head. But we also need to be asking, what do I do with intimacy when I get it? Am I able to hold on to their love? Am I able to feel connected and loved with them if they are more in their head? Or they're not really engaging directly emotionally, all right? A lot of us emotionally connected people, we're like feeling like if my spouse doesn't engage my feelings, then they don't care, you know? Um, so our question is, can we stay grounded, sense of self, feel connected, even if they aren't connecting right now, all right? Like I said, most marriage conferences just push on the y'all be more emotionally connected bit but this is as big a problem, the, the needfulness, the um, um, emotional need to always have connection and feel scared or, you know, we have marriage problems if we're not doing that, is as big a problem, okay? They need to grow in terms of being close and connected. We need to grow in terms of kind of being grounded and cool even if they're not, all right? Intimacy is like play and catch. Yeah, somebody needs to throw the ball, but our question is, how good are we at catching it and keeping it when we do? Y'all remember that marriage guru who said a woman needs five meaningful touches a day in order to feel loved? And I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. But I, I just have one question. What did she do with the first four? I'm just asking. Why five? And is she going to need six? I don't know. What is she doing with love when she gets it? All right? Us connector types need to take responsibility for that. Otherwise, what will happen is our spouse is going to feel that longing or that hunger or that disappointment from us that we're not connecting better, and they will feel it as this demand of something they're supposed to need or else. And what will happen is, is that we will start a dance. And let's talk about dances for a minute. Because this is so key to understanding marriage is understanding that every couple has dances. In fact, when I do pre-engagement counseling, and by the way, I do pre-engagement counseling. I stopped doing premarital counseling. That's a sucker bet, man. Okay, if you, if you singles are thinking about wanting to get premarital, get pre-engagement. Because once you get engaged, how do I say this? the mothers are involved, okay? And so <laughs> the poor therapist is either like, yeah, y'all are great. Y'all's relationship's going to be great. And then when, like, he's abusing her in five years, like, who did their premarital? It's like John Cook. Or you say, y'all are a dumpster fire, and the moms are mad because their friends have already volunteered to do, you know, announcement parties, and their things have already been printed, and you've ruined their life. So anyway, I'm like, I don't do premarital, no. but pre-engagement. But what I do in pre-engagement is let's learn your dance. You do X, which makes you do Y, which makes you do X worse, which makes you do Y worse, and that is a dance. This is secret of the universe for marriage. 
Marriage problems are not linear. Marriage problems are not cause and effect. That's one of the reasons it's so dumb to live in a blame marriage. Well, this wouldn't have happened if you hadn't. That's so dumb. Well, that implies that this is cause and effect. You did A, which made B happen. End of story. No, the truth is you do A, which makes me do B, which makes you do A worse, which makes me do B worse, and we're off to the races in a cycle, in a dance. And so one of the ways that I do marriage therapy um, is to help a couple learn what their dance is, right? And we'll talk about this more in the conflict talk. But I want you to learn, you know, what your dances are. Here's a brief one um, as an example. I was seeing a couple a while back, and her husband can be kind of bossy and controlling, and she hadn't had been able to have much of a voice. Um, and she's decided she wants to have a voice. So now she speaks. This is what I believe. And that feels really refreshing to her because she's always kind of been little Miss Submissive and done what he wants. So she says who she is. But admittedly, after a few years of being squished in a little submission box, um, she, she says who she is with a little bit of a spice to it, okay? Now, he, who wants to be in control of everything, hears this as like she's got this tone, like she's little Miss Bossy. And he goes, oh, my gosh, I don't know why you have to just always be pushing back on everything I say. Which makes her feel like, oh, look, he's trying to control me again. No way he's going to control me. So now she comes back with more spice, which he goes, oh, whoa. Now I push back, and she's really, like, disrespecting me. And so he escalates. You feel the dance? And you go on and on and on to the old folks home. Okay? So I want to talk about dances with intimacy, okay? Um, we'll talk about some dances in conflict next talk, but let's talk about dances with intimacy. It's kind of like dances with wolves, but without the Indians, okay? All right, so a lot of times you'll have a real abider who's married to a real TC beer, and again, those are on a continuum, and you'll, but, but you tend one more or the other, but I want you to have the categories, okay? So abider comes with all these feelings. And they're like, I'm afraid of this, or I wish that, or I'm sad about this, right? All these kind of um, level four feelings. Now, what does TCB Elvis say to that? Well, why don't you take up jogging? Or, here, give me the phone. I'll tell her where she can put her carpool. You know, in other words, who cares about how you feel? That's not fixing anything. Let's solve this problem, right? Okay, let's fix it. Now, pause. Why do they do that? Is it because they don't really care about your feelings? Because they're jerks? They just want to gloss over how you're hurting, move on? No. It's because that's what level three is about. That's what they do. They solve problems. That's why I told you those categories. In other words, this is their natural habitat. It's not that they don't care or they don't want to know what you feel or they don't want to be with you in your pain, it's like if you're com communicating something about emotional connection to someone who is, tends to be gridded toward TCB problem solving, you know, it's, it's like they know habla, they know speak of their language, okay? And, and it's, it, but it's not that they're bad, and it's not that they don't care. Remember, no blame marriage is where we started. It's just you're getting off at different floors, okay? Again, we're not making anybody bad. Because that's, that's the deal breaker, okay? That's the mind killer. Anyway, dance. Uh, a biter wants to be all intimate. Um, TC Beer wants to solve the problems and be done with it. And so here we go. So problem solver has all these solutions, but that doesn't feel very emotional and intimate to the abider. So they feel really kind of pushed away and not happy. So what do they start doing when they start to dance? They start demanding closeness from Elvis and criticizing them for not being able to connect with them better. I just feel lonely all the time every time I talk to you. Um, instead of getting married, you should have, like, stayed in the frat house. Or, you know, living with you is like living with an android. You know, which all of which woos him toward her, of course. You know, um, in other words, how does problem-solving Elvis hear this? Super critical. You're saying the worst thing you could ever say to a problem-solving bottom liner they're a failure. You're not happy with their performance. They're about performing. They're about fixing. And you've told them, you failed, okay? 
By the way, number one thing I hear in my office from TCB spouses is very interesting. What do you want? And they'll say, I just want her to be happy. And they think that fixing it will do that. That's why they do it, okay? All right, so a biter has this like, I'm disappointed in you because you're not connecting me. What does TCB do? Well, the exact thing that the biter wants the least, they withdraw. They get the heck out of Dodge. They're on the golf course somewhere, all right? So now Priscilla feels really abandoned. You know, he's on Tim Buck emotionally, and so what does she do? She gets more demanding, more critical, and I guess you're just going to sit there and not, just not say anything, huh? Okay? Well, anyway, he's so defeated now that of course he is. And you see the dance, how they perpetuated and created and exacerbated the scene? It's so important in your marriage to learn those dances and recognize that you have them, okay? One of the values of marriage therapy or conferences is that even if your therapist is a complete bird brain, it's helpful to have somebody help you step out of your system and look back at it, all right? What are we doing? We'll talk about this in the next talk. What is going on with this dance? I think we're doing the same dance again. That objectivity is a marriage changer right there, okay? Because most people just live in that dance and don't even realize they're doing it. The one I just described is called the approacher-avoider dance. And we'll just do it till, you know, the end of time. I want you to have it as a category of like, ooh, I recognize this. This is like what Cox was talking about, right? Okay. So what intimacy is, we look at some levels of it, both sides of it. Can I let you in? Can I keep you in? Some problems and dances that come from it. Let's talk about how we can grow here, and then we'll take a break, and we'll come back and talk about conflict, all right? So growth. Let's start with TC Beers. Number one, TC Beers, guys or ladies. Let's talk to you all first. Number one, learn to see the relational world as valid, okay? I think you're probably getting that point by now since I've like beat it into the ground. And if you don't feel the relational emotional world is valid, get relational people to teach you. There's a lot of us out there and it is a skill, okay? It's one of those character abilities that we literally learn. It's not, that's one of the problems I have with, um, personality profiles, by the way. People like Enneagram, whatever. I'm just an eight. It's like, oh, really? For the rest of eternity, you're just going to be an eight? Well, I mean, I think it's nice to have a category of I'm kind of a this because it shows where you need to grow. I'm just a so-and-so, which means I like everything in order. Okay, great. That's where you need to grow. What would it take for you to stretch and grow and deal with some chaos and some disorder? Get busy. Or I'm just one of those people who just wants to relate, kind of a golden retriever. Good. Um, so now you know where you need to grow. You need to grow in the area of kind of getting things done and being tough, all right? In other words, so don't land on your personality style and say, well, I'm just a... Um, see it as a... Remember I told you last night, the goal is being integrated. It's being like Christ. It's, it's being powerful and loving, okay? So um, there's growth for each in that sense. So... I hope you're getting that message here this morning, um, TC Beers, that, okay, I'm not just a TC Beer. Maybe you are, but I want you to be growing in the area of emotional connection. A lot of guys especially can touchy-feely this too much and feel like, you know, when somebody's talking about emotional connection, you need to be more intimate. It means you're going to have to, like, go open up on the golf course or something, you know. It's like, hey, uh, guys, um, I just wanted y'all to know I've, got this aching void within me, you know, like, you know, or, 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 or like, hey, hey uh, uh, before you swing, um, just wanted to ask, any, any of you guys ever sometimes feel like crying for no reason? No, no, we're not talking about that, all right? <laughs> we're just talking about intimacy as you have some relationships, some relationships, safe ones, collect ones, in which you share who you are, okay? And there, there's a lot of talk about you know, men are into a goal attainment and women are into a relationship. But don't buy the whole enchilada on that. We're going to talk on this a little in the sermon tomorrow. But think about how this whole marriage thing began. God didn't come to Adam and say, look, Adam, you know, I know that you're just fine with your 4 by 4 and your mountain bike and this has been a great time for you, but how do I say this? I'm, I'm going to 
I'm going to make a woman, okay? And, and she's going she's gonna to need a lot, all right? And you're going to have to learn, like, to share your feelings and, like, communication skills. And, you know, but we've been through a lot, Adam. Do this for me, you know? That's not the story. The story is he comes to Adam and he says, I'm seeing how, um, uh, how, how emotionally needful you are. I want to give to you. Someone who's suitable for you. So, T.C. Beers recognized, to the degree that we're not feeling that longing at some level in our lives, see that as an issue to be aware of. A lot of times you'll see, if we're not emotionally connected, if we only live TCB and emotionally detached, it'll come out as symptoms in other places. Loneliness, depression, a ton of addictions and substitutes, other places I go to get a rush, um, or uh, can pop up about it. And, and besides, part of the reason that a lot of non-emotional people are non-emotional is because they're afraid. Get to looking at that. You, you find them doing something they're not afraid to be emotional in, like needle in stadium. There's a lot of emotion over there. There's nobody over there going TCB. It's like, well, obviously the cornerback needs, you know, they're like, yeah, you know, and they're painted orange, you know. That guy's emotional, dude, okay? <laughs> anyway, so if you don't see that, it's, if, you, if the emotional thing doesn't click for you at all, then God made it us that way. So be sure you got off on the right planet. Check your ticket stub because he made it for us to do that. All right. And, and, and look for people, body of Christ people again, safe people who do get it to teach us. I needed that. I used to really be much more of a TCBer than I am uh, an abider now. I used to be more left brain, but I got engaged more and more and more with people, some therapists, some just safe body of Christ people who called me out. And they would say, dude, you're telling a story that's really, like, that's intense. And you're telling it like you're, like, reporting the news. Where's your heart? And I'd be like, I don't know. And they're like, well, you look really sad. And I'm like, do I? And this piece were actually teaching me to find this thing that I didn't see. We need external eyes to do that sometimes. All right. Number two with TCB is learn what it means to be with. Um, I touched on this a little last night. Let's talk about it a little bit more. A lot of times what TCBers feel like they need to do if their spouse brings their emotion, I'm hurting or I'm sad or I'm mad at my best friend, is what? They're problem solvers. They feel like they need to fix it, right? Take on that problem, resolve it which would be overwhelming to anyone, okay? This emotional person always dumping their emotions on my doorstep, and I'm supposed to fix it? Ah. So I'll ultimately get overwhelmed, withdraw, shut down, disappear, and we cue the dance, okay? So here's the good news, TC Beers. You don't have to fix it, okay? Let me give you a simple little model that I use I also apply this to parenting, but it applies to anybody in relationship. Where to be in response to other people's feelings. John Cox's little model. You can either blow it off, you can learn what it means to be with, or we can try to fix. All right, obviously blow off is where it's like, eh, get over it. You know, starving kids in Africa. Or one of the things I see my clients do a lot in my office um, is they'll be talking about an area in their life where they're really struggling. They'll go, I know, I know, I know, first world problem. And I've gotten to where I'll say, you are correct. It is a first world problem because the third world really understands relationship and really understands connection and community. And we live in the first world, which is lonely and isolated and shame-filled and frightened. So, yeah, it is a first world problem. They are horrible, aren't they? And I know that's kind of passive-aggressive, but that's what I think of this first world problem thing. In other words, our culture is really screwed up. A first world problem is how lonely we all are. Anyway, blow off is kind of like discounting. Fix, obviously, we've talked about. Um, but with is going to be more about connection. It's going to be about, I'm not going to fix it or try to solve it for you, but I'm going to be with you. So, someone deals with a death. Blow off is like, Okay, well, you know, he's the Lord. He's with the Lord now. It's all good. All things work together. In other words, I'm going to blow off your emotion. Fix is, hey, I tell you what, after the funeral, let's, let's go to New Orleans or something for a weekend. Just blow it out. You want to? 
with is like this. You know why you don't know what to say at a funeral? Because there's nothing to say at a funeral. I can't imagine all y'all are going through. We're going to walk it at your side. We're going to walk it at your side. In other words, you're present with me. You're with me. And remember that thing I told you last night that I don't understand why it's true? Pain with is how? Something about being with someone else in their pain helps metabolize it. Okay? So we don't fix it. We connect. So your spouse comes in, they're talking about some big problem. You don't need to take it on and fix it. Say, oh, baby, male or female, husband or wife, baby. I said, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that. You did all that work and somebody else got the credit for it. That's, oh, my gosh, that would have felt so horrible. Ugh, how can I give to you there? What do you need? Here, I'm not fixing it. I'm just with them in it. And you know what they're going to say? Nothing. I just wanted you to know. I wanted you with me. That's what they'll say. Okay? Something super healing about that. Okay? So, you fixers, you like fixing things. This is actually how to fix it. We're not saying quit fixing, just fix it right. All right? I did have a TCB guy ask me once after a comp. He comes up and he goes, like, Yeah, but, um, what if her feelings are wrong? <laughs> she says everybody in the church hates her, and I know that's not true, you know. Can I tell her she's wrong? Like, don't feel that way. And, and I'm like, well, that's, that's a pretty good question, you know. Um, our wounded and pathological emotions are often incorrect, okay? But remember what I said earlier, secret of the universe, in order to get somebody out of it, to bring truth, we have to be heard first in that order. So be with them, hear them first. Oh my gosh, baby, nobody in the church likes you and you heard about it every Sunday and blah, 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 and I so get it. Then you can say, you know, by the way, swing back later, I know some things I think mitigate against what you believe. If you ever want to know them, please let me know because I think they would help your heart. On their terms, notice. Most fixers are fixing because I'm uncomfortable and I want you to feel better. A real fix is, if you're uncomfortable, I'm going to manage my discomfort, but it's up to you. I've got some goodies for you if you want them. That's a good fix, okay? The only exception to this, all this hearing and with stuff, by the way, is unrepentant jerks, which is a kind of a different show, and chronic whiners, okay? Sometimes, uh, and I can feel it in my office with my sense of feel, People who come in every time and they just want to kind of carry on about how miserable they are and how so-and-so treats them and how hard this is and how hard that is. And you never see them really want to engage it to actually be powerful and try to solve this and take some ownership and responsibility for it. You could do empathy with those people till the cows come home and they're not going to grow. With those people, I find myself, I have to shift after a few sessions and go, well, yeah, this is kind of like what you were saying last week. Um... And the week before that, and you know, um, what do you think you need in order to find something powerful in yourself to be getting yourself out of that? And I'm pushing them more in the power direction, but that's a, just a by the way. All right, TC Beers, you got that? All right, I'm going to talk to the biters now. So TC Beers, you can play like Candy Crunch or whatever on your phone now for the next. Okay, <laughs> our turn, abiders number one. Learn to ask for closeness in your relationships as opposed to criticize, demand, be disappointed about a lack of closeness, okay? I had a woman in my office a while back, and she said, my husband sat down, I said, we made dinner, we sat down, and immediately he gets on his phone at the dinner table. So naturally, she responded by going, would you put your phone down for like five seconds and talk to me? Makes me want to cuddle, right? To the degree that our longing and need for emotional connection comes across as this disappointed demand to our TCB spouse, cue the dance, baby. They're going to pop smoke and they are out of here. They're on Neptune emotionally. 
because they've disappointed us again, okay? I want you to ask them. Super sophisticated stuff here, okay? I want you to say, you know, I'd really like to be closer to you this evening. Could we work that into our time together as well? Or would you be willing, when you're finished what you're doing on your phone, would you be willing to put it down a second? I'd love to talk to you. I love the term, would you be willing, by the way. It begins by saying implicitly, this is not about me controlling you. This is about me honoring the fact that you get to choose. But would you be willing for this? And it sets us up for what we're going to talk about in the next talk, which is a mutual win-win, how we both matter, okay? I also like this. This is a little bit of a throwaway. When your spouse does something boneheaded, rather than saying, I can't believe you did that, instead of hammering them on something they did yesterday, ask for a would you be willing in the future. Hey, in the future, like tonight felt kind of bad with your parents. In the future, if your mom is critical of me, in the future, would you be willing to sort of advocate for me? That would feel really good for me. And now what you're doing is asking for something positive rather than going, I can't believe you just stood there while your mom, okay, you're beating them up, which is going to start a fight. Ask for what you'd like, okay? So ask, don't tell. Number two, I want you to recognize something. I've never heard anybody else talk about this, but I experience it because I do it for a living, maybe. But recognize that our longing to be connected to, the request for someone to drop what they're doing, shift gears into an emotionally connected position and hear our hearts is costly. That is a big ask. A lot of us emotional connectors are like, I don't understand why they just don't want to like abide and connect and all well, because it's hard. It's costly. Another Chris Rock joke. He says, when your wife says, I wish we talked more, what she means is, I wish I talked more. And you sat there and listened to me, okay? <laughs> In other words, we can assume, like, people should listen to our emotions more. Yeah, but that's hard. It's a big ask, okay? That's one of the reasons TC beers don't, don't abide more, okay? I listen for a living. It's costly. I, had a, I was doing something in a court, and the judge asked me how much I charged an hour, and I told him, he said, that's a lot of money to sit and just talk. And I said, yeah, but it's not much money to sit and listen. And he goes, grammar. <laughs> okay, I mean, I've talked to you a lot about what a connector, a biter I am, but I'm also a dude, all right? And think about it. I had a wife and three girls. I lived with four women. All they did was talk. I wanted one of those, like, tennis line judge guys, you know. I just want, you know, those guys are like, quiet, please. And everybody gets quiet. I'm like, I love that guy. I want that guy right by the fireplace, okay? Just quiet, please. <laughs> All right, another growth point for connectors. Share your feelings, but remember your feelings are still your responsibility. This is huge for us connectors. In other words, what us connectors will often say is, I feel lonely in our marriage. Trojan virus implication there because of you. What are you going to do about it? Okay? Which is going to make your TCB spouse pop smoke. Okay? Responsibility says, you know what? I'm realizing I'm feeling lonely and I'm not sure why. But I'm getting curious about it, and I want you to know. And I'm talking to my body of Christ people. And it could be that there's a disconnect with us. Maybe not. Maybe this is me. But I wanted you to be with, 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 with me in it. Do you hear the responsibility? Do you hear the ownership? This is my feeling, and I am making sense of it, not just dumping it on your doorstep again, which is going to make your TCB spouse leave you emotionally again, okay? This is the fourth I, impulse control. Can I have a feeling and talk about it rather than doing it. Y'all remember the fourth I, okay? And that's going to feel so good to your problem solver spouse who otherwise is going to feel like you're just dumping something on their door. So your feelings are your responsibility. And one step deeper, the goal of intimacy is for you to be known, not for your spouse to just make you feel better. Bring your feelings because that's connection, not because you're telling your spouse what you feel so they'll be different. We're about to talk about solving problems in a minute, 
But a lot of us intimate connectors are like, well, I just feel lonely. The implication meaning you're supposed to do something to make me feel better. No, intimacy is to share who I am, not to make you change. Okay? We can ask for that. Remember? Ask, don't criticize. But be aware. Next, in addition to that, this is the fourth eye. Sharing your feelings is not the same as doing your feelings. So key for us connectors. All right? I totally lost in my notes. Okay, yeah. So your wife starts sobbing like, I just feel like, you know, I'm worried about our marriage. Or maybe the, TC, uh, the um, abiding, connecting husband is like freaking out in anxiety. Oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? I'm just sharing my feelings. No, you're not. You're doing your feelings, okay? It's not the same thing. I'm scared about your job, and, and I really want to talk about that together. It's real different from, oh, my gosh, we're going to end up living in a trailer. I'm just sharing my feelings. No, you're not. You're carpet bombing Cambodia with your feelings, okay? And that's just going to set your TCB spouse off, and they're off to the dance, all right? One last thing, us abiders, and we'll do a break. Have other resources, like we talked about some last night. This is applicable to everything we've talked about in every blind spot, and that is... Well, let me put it this way. I know that you want more connection and intimacy in your marriage, and I want it for you. And there are a few things that are sad as a relationship in which you long for more connection that's not there. And I hope I've made it clear this morning that that's an important thing to build that. Um, And you singles, for you to get married. But there's more to the story than that. I know this is a cultural no-no to say this, but I'm going to jump out on the limb and start sawing again. Marriage was never intended to be our sole resource for meeting all of our needs for intimacy. Well, maybe one kind of intimacy, okay. But sure, God created us to have deep, deep connection and sharing with our spouses. But think about it. The New Testament talks a lot more about intimacy in the body of Christ than it does intimacy in marriage. And our culture, and even our little Christian culture, has turned marriage into this ultimate fount of all of our needs, y'all. You know, some special time together, some little cute couple time. Y'all need to get away together. We need to get you a wife. And that's going to be what really, that's where our, 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 our epicenter of goodness is going to be. God doesn't say that. That's cultural, okay? What he says is, in the body, love one another. Um, go to one another, bear with one another, confess to one another, confront one another, be one in the body, all right? But since our culture has lost this culture of connection and abiding, then we've created things like therapy and small groups and all that, which is great. But we've turned marriage into this super sacred little secret place where you're supposed to get all your wonderful needs met, and it's no wonder we're disappointed. And it's no wonder singles are freaking out. What if I never get married? I'll miss out on the fount of wonder. So, TCBers, abiders, whomever, again, we have got to have good, rich resources pouring new things into the stagnant pond from outside of us. And you connector types, having other people in your life who you've learned are safe and wise and truth-telling and secret-keeping, and you bring your stuff to them, Otherwise, what we have is most marriages. Let me describe most marriages emotionally. Is I'm trying to get all of my emotional needs met by you. Please tell me that I'm enough and I'm sufficient and you're proud of me. And I'm trying to get all my emotional needs met by you. Tell me that you want me and desire me and want to be connected with me all the time. And I'm trying to get all my emotional needs met by you. And you're trying to get your emotional needs met by me. And we have a situation that we call here in the South, two ticks and no dog. And a lot of the reason you fight is because your tick ain't giving you what you want. And she's like, well, I thought you were bringing the picnic basket. I don't got nothing. That's why I married you. All right? This is why this conference is oriented toward you and your heart and your character and your abilities, not so much on like, I want you to turn to your spouse right now and share this with them. 
We have to have a you conference before a marriage conference. Until you're making sense of the stuff your tick is needing, you're going to dump it on your spouse, and it's going to be a fight all day long. So you want a better marriage, abiders, either way, develop these kind of relationships. We can talk more about what they're like and how to find them. And what happens, abiders, is we go out, we get some of these emotional goodies in our connections with other people, and we get kind of filled up, and we come home to our TCB or spouse, but we're already kind of full. You know, it's like when you ate before you get to the party. And so the dance doesn't happen because you're not so hungry, and they're not going to disappoint you so much. All right. As Forrest Gump says, that's all I got to say about that. All right, let's do 10 or 15 minutes and come back and do conflict and Q&A.